guys, and welcome to the Moms and Murder Podcast, a true crime podcast featuring myself, Mandy, and my dear friend, Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Hey, Mandy. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. How are you? Doing really good. It's a Friday night, and the rain is pouring here and will be all weekend, and there are definitely frogs mating outside, so hopefully that does not come across on my on my recording, but I was a little nervous there for a while. It's yeah. very, really far over here. <laughs> yeah, I've been following the weather all week this week after you told me that there was like a little tropical like system forming. There was, and we're living in it right now. It did not yeah. become anything, but I am here to bring you the news first. It's just not always factual. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so no hurricane, just lots and lots of rain, which is really nothing new for us. We're used to that in the summer, so for it's sure. okay. I'm okay with it. We can deal. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) So we have a couple of announcements this week. We're going to really talk about them a little bit more at the end of the show, but we do have some exciting stuff coming up. Melissa and I were asked to participate in a live show with our friends at Corpus Delicti, and we have a lot more details and information about that that we're going to share. And then we also have a meetup coming up as well. I know if you've listened to the show for a little while, then you know last year we did a meetup with some other Southern true crime podcasts, and we did it in Atlanta, and that was so much fun, and we had such a great time, and we're doing it again with the same group of podcasts that was with us last year. And then I think there's going to be a few more this year that are joining us. So we'll talk about the details of that at the end of the show, unless you have more to say about that, Melissa. (laughs) No, I think you've done a really great job setting it up for the end of the show. So I hope I have all the details I am supposed to have. (laughs) Fingers crossed. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. So we're going to get right into the story this week. This week, we're talking about a murder that took place in the very picturesque location of Bali, Indonesia. And of course, when you think of Bali, that's normally a place that you think of that's really bursting with culture and beautiful beaches and all these exotic resorts. And it's really the perfect backdrop for a romantic honeymoon or a special family vacation. Bali really has everything. It has good food. It has plenty of adventure with their countless scuba diving and snorkeling sites, as well as sightseeing tours and river rafting excursions. And it really just seems impossible to have a bad time at a place like this. For Chicago natives Sheila Von Weiss Mack and her teenage daughter Heather, taking a vacation to an exotic part of the world was an annual tradition. And in 2014, it was also a great opportunity for the mother-daughter duo to spend some time together and hopefully repair some of the rift between them. But before we talk about what happened on their vacation in Bali, we are going to tell you a little bit about Bali in this week's segment of We Googled This City. The population of Bali was around 3.8 million residents as of the 2010 census. I think that's the most we've ever had. I know. Is that the most we've ever had? (laughs) I am not keeping a running tally, but even my eyes were like bazoongas coming out of them. So I was was pumped for this. So Bali, as Mandy was saying, is a very beautiful Indonesian island that's known for its rice paddies, its beaches, coral reef, and forested volcanic mountains. Speaking of volcanic mountains, thanks to these volcanoes on the island, much of the beaches in Bali actually have black sand. It's actually really beautiful. You would think like black sand might look like tar or something. I don't know. But I saw some pictures and it's really gorgeous. The only other place I know of that has black sand beaches is Costa Rica. I'm sure there's more places just than that, but I think we it's will like a vol- we will hear about it. We'll hear thing. everybody's yeah. beach. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only other place that I can think of off the top of my head that I've heard of that. But yeah, I've seen pictures and it looks really interesting. Much different. It's a very much of a stark contrast to the white sand beaches that I'm used to seeing. Yeah, so, for sure. Really, yeah. really pretty though. And I saw some nighttime photos, and it's really gorgeous at night. So in Bali, the impossible actually takes place. Bali celebrates what's known as Naipi Day, and it's a day that's actually their new year, but it's a day where the whole island is closed. So there's no work, no travel, no airports are open. If you're a tourist, SOL for you. There's no noise, not even electricity. People actually spend this day meditating and self-reflecting. I would love to try and bring my kids there for that day and see (laughs) if Bali can make them be quiet for five minutes. (laughs) One thing I thought was really interesting in Bali is their naming process of how they name their children. So the people of Bali actually name their kids four different names, and that's really it. Your first baby's name is Wyan. The second baby is Maid. The third baby is Nyoman. And the fourth baby is Kitat. I looked up pronunciations of this and I really had a hard time. So I'm just doing Wait. the best I can. 
So everybody if, names their everybody, kids that? Yes, those are your first four names. So if you have a fifth baby, that baby is also Wyan. It starts all over again. So Wyan literally means first baby. Maid means second baby. Naomin means third baby. And okay. <laughs> fourth just, baby is Keita. <laughs> I'm just staring off into space because I don't understand. So are you telling me that every single person that lives in Bali has like one of these four names? Okay. I don't feel comfortable going on the record and saying every <laughs> single person, but I saw this on several websites that said basically that's how in this culture they name their babies. Obviously not everybody, but it seems like t- majority of people watch it be everybody. But I think that's like, that's the normal thing they do. It's just those four that's and then it rotates very again. very interesting. That's Isn't really interesting. It? Yeah. You have like not a lot of thought going into your name. That takes one thing off you know, the parents' minds, like, yeah, no, you might look like a maid, but your name is going to be Wyan. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, the world's most expensive cup of coffee is called Kopi Luwak. And it's one of these specialties in Bali. These cups of coffee can go for around $50 a cup. The coffee beans for this coffee are gathered from none other than Civet cats. And if you're thinking, Melissa, I've never heard of a plant called Civet. Well, that's because it's actually a freaking cat and their coffee comes from cat poop. And I know this is true. (laughs) I know this is true because my father-in-law has ordered something like this before and it blows my mind. So anyone that thinks Diet Coke is weird, like (laughs) nobody has a dog that's pooping out Diet Coke. So I really don't want to hear about it. So hold on. This is going to be a first for Moms and Murder. I am going to sing the jingle for the <laughs> Kopi Luwak theme song. <clears throat> also, I can't sing, so here we go. <laughs> the best part of waking up is cat turds in your cup. <laughs> I cannot believe that is a real thing. It's a real thing, and I know for a fact. Yeah, like trust me, that was one I was like, I don't even have to Google this. My father-in-law drinks this stuff, so. <laughs> Yeah, that's where we're at in the world. So, Mandy, please let's get out of this. Please, please save <laughs> okay. me from myself. All right, on to the story. Like many teenagers, Heather Mack and her mom, Sheila, disagreed over nearly everything from Heather's grades and attendance in school to her choice in boys. This all sounds pretty run of the mill for a teenage girl and her mom, but the tensions between these two ran much deeper than that. Although Sheila genuinely loved her daughter and wanted to help her succeed, she was unable to control the teen, and the two of them would fight often, sometimes even physically. The relationship between Sheila and Heather began a downward spiral in 2006 following the sudden death of Heather's father, James Mack. Heather was just 10 years old at the time of her father's passing, and to make matters worse, the family was on vacation in Greece when he suffered a pulmonary embolism while in the family's hotel room. He was 76 years old at the time of his death. Although his death was somewhat unexpected, James had been wheelchair-bound for the last three years of his life and had been in declining health for quite some time. If the name James Mack sounds familiar to you, it's because he was a famous conductor, composer, and producer that worked on over 60 albums for various artists and record labels, including Columbia Records. He was talented in classical music but also conducted orchestras. James had been through two failed marriages by the time he met Sheila, and they went on to become parents to their only child, Heather. According to Heather, her childhood was picture perfect up until her father passed away, leaving her with what she alleged was a physically and emotionally abusive mother. And when I was researching this part of the story, my heart just really went out to Heather and that whole situation. My dad passed away about eight years ago now, and I was much older than 10, much older than Heather was in this story, but... I can just imagine, you know, knowing what I went through with losing a parent and then thinking about her just being 10 and I have a son who's almost 10 and that's just such a hard time, I feel like, in your life. There's never a good time, you know, to lose a parent, but at that time in your life, I can see how that would really throw you into a lot of, you know, a a tumultuous situation with your emotions and everything whenever you're still trying to kind of figure out life and you're starting to go through adolescence and all of that. So this was a very, very, very rough time for Heather. As Heather got older, the fights between she and her mom became more and more intense, and there was slapping, shoving, scratching. Heather alleges that her mom would burn her with cigarettes, and she also claimed that her mom was an alcoholic and was using drugs. So she said that this contributed to a lot of the fights that they had. 
By Heather's accounts of her home life, she would frequently be up until the wee hours of the morning fighting with her mom, who had been drinking heavily all night. She would hide the keys to Sheila's car so that she couldn't drive it anywhere. And things were really so bad between Sheila and Heather that between 2004 and 2013, the police had been called to their home a staggering 86 times on domestic violence calls. Oh, my gosh. That's almost 10 a year. That's a lot. Like one a month, really, for nine years. Yeah. And it was really both of them would call. Heather would call on her mom for various reasons. And then sometimes Sheila would call on her own daughter and have the police come out and check things out. Usually when the police would show up, the two of them would decline to press charges. But in 2011, Heather was actually arrested for a scuffle with Sheila that ended in a broken arm on Sheila's part. She, she ended up shoving her mom to the ground and Sheila had a broken arm at the end of it. So Heather actually got arrested for that. Sheila would often tell the police that her daughter needed psychiatric help and that she suffered with mental health difficulties. Heather eventually dropped out of high school before her junior year and spent some time living in facilities for minors that were in the juvenile court system. Those close to the family believe that the real problem between Sheila and her daughter was that she tried to be more of a friend than a mother, and there was really no enforced rules or boundaries. Despite the obvious chaos in their relationship, Sheila and Heather maintained a somewhat put-together appearance meaning people who knew them looking from the outside would absolutely never know, you know, by looking at photos and looking at their life that they had such a rocky relationship, really. Following the death of James Mack, Sheila and Heather continued their annual tradition of vacationing abroad. And in 2014, they planned a 10 day trip to Bali. Sheila, who was desperate to have a better relationship with her daughter, viewed the trip as a way for the two of them to connect and reset and hopefully find some common ground. But in the weeks leading up to this trip, even more drama ensued. Heather actually stole Sheila's credit card in late July of 2014 and used it to pay for a hotel room and brung up nearly $1,000 in charges. Sheila reported this to the police, who then located Heather and her boyfriend, Tommy Schaefer, at the hotel. Tommy was not too happy to see police and behaved in a very belligerent manner, which led to him being arrested for disorderly conduct. Tommy was not well liked by Sheila. He was a source of many arguments between herself and her daughter. He was 21, which was three years older than Heather, and he was an aspiring rapper that used the stage name Tommy X. Tommy had grown up with a shaky home life and was the type of kid who really gravitated towards friends who had more stable families. Parents of Tommy's friends throughout school considered him to be a bad influence and noticed that he was always surrounded by some kind of drama. Tommy was also known as being a habitual liar and would often stretch the truth to people to manipulate them and situations to his liking. It seemed that Tommy had been living with some inner turmoil for much of his adolescence, but the death of his girlfriend in April of 2014 really caused him to unravel. He had been dating this girl named Rachel for about a year when she was killed in a car accident in South Africa where she had been studying. Tommy and Heather had previously been friends prior to his romance with Rachel, but ignited a romantic relationship themselves just a short time after Rachel's sudden death. The couple began to date on and off for several months, much to the dismay of Sheila, who thought that Tommy was going to bring Heather down. So when the mother and daughter made plans to go to Bali together, Sheila was all too thrilled to get Heather away from Tommy, even if just for a couple of weeks. When Heather and Sheila arrived in Bali, they checked into one of the best resorts on the island. It was the five-star St. Regis Hotel. Rooms at this resort go for as much as $2,000 per night, but what guests get in return is a -a once-in-a-lifetime luxury vacation experience. Sheila and Heather basked in the lavish surroundings, taking in extravagant chandeliers and this grand entryway, and they were eventually taken to their room, which was number 317. That room had all the comforts of home and then some, including a balcony with a view and a separate lounge area. Anyone at the hotel who observed Sheila and Heather from a distance would have thought that they were as close as any mother and daughter could be, really. They were just enjoying a nice vacation and bonding with each other. They dined on the finest cuisine and sipped exotic cocktails. They hung out together at the pool and took walks on the beach. Although it appeared that Sheila and Heather were spending a lot of time together, Heather had actually been spending quite a bit of time by herself as well. Throughout the trip, she would disappear for hours at a time, which began to concern Sheila. 
On August 11th, 2014, about 10 days into this magical vacation, Heather took off on her own for the day and Sheila assumed that she would be back before dark, but she became more unsettled as the sun went down and the hours ticked by with no sign of her daughter. Keep in mind at this point, Heather is 18, so technically she was an adult and she was allowed to do whatever she wanted. So even though Sheila was a little worried, she didn't want to cause a scene or she didn't want to raise an alarm because this whole time that they're on this vacation in Bali, Sheila is just trying to use this opportunity to really reconnect with her daughter and kind of build their relationship back up. So she didn't want to, you know, she didn't want to be that mom who was like, where are you? When are you coming home? Or, you know, make a fuss about her daughter being out doing her own thing. So she waited, but when it finally got to be about three o'clock in the morning, the anxiety got to her and she went down to the hotel lobby where she asked the front desk if anyone had seen her daughter anywhere. After a little bit of conversation, a hotel employee explained that Heather was actually in the hotel. And this employee said, yeah, she's in your other room. Yeah. And so Sheila was like, what do you mean my other room? She was, you know, very confused and was demanding an explanation. So the staff member was then also confused. And she reminded Sheila, you know, hey, you're paying for two rooms. But the only problem is that Sheila was not paying for two rooms, not that she was aware of. So she immediately realized what had happened and realized that Heather must have taken her credit card again and booked herself a second room. Sheila soon learned that the room was actually booked under the name Schaefer. And so she figured out pretty quickly that Tommy was actually there in Bali and was in a room that she was actually paying for. And we are going to get into so many more details of this story after one quick break for a word from this week's sponsors. School starts in just a few weeks and we all want to start off strong and really show it to little Timmy's mom that you too can pack beautiful little meals with fresh organic fruits and veggies. Cut to October when we're making lunches in the car on the way to school and screaming, if you wanted your apples cut up, you should have woken up earlier. Half the problem with these fancy schmancy lunches is just staying on top of my grocery shopping. Thanks to Instacart, that's a thing of the past. Here in Florida, we are up to our eyeballs in afternoon rain showers. And by the time I get the kids ready to go out the door, we are in the middle of our mini monsoons. And this is where Instacart is a total lifesaver. If you're not familiar with Instacart, here's what I did. I downloaded the Instacart app, picked out my grocery store from a list available to me in my area, and put in a quick order to be shopped for and delivered to my house by a friendly Instacart shopper. The Instacart shopper gathers your groceries with care by selecting excellent produce, and if there are any issues with the order, they will contact you when necessary. Instacart will deliver your groceries in as little as one hour or at a time you select. They bag them so your hot items stay hot and your cold items stay cold. Try Instacart and get $10 off your first order. To get this limited time offer, go to instacart.com or download the mobile app and enter our promo code MOMS10 at checkout. That's $10 off your first order today at instacart.com or through the mobile app. And don't forget to enter our code MOMS10, instacart.com or through the mobile app with our code MOMS10 at checkout. Summer is in full swing, and that means trips to the beach, afternoons by the pool, barbecues, and family reunions. Sometimes these summer events call for a cold beer, but in this heat, you know that once you pop the top, the race is on to finish it before it gets warm and stale. That's where Brewmate comes in. Brewmate's stylish, insulated drinkware is designed to keep your favorite beverages ice cold all day long. Brewmate has so many different designs, there is truly something for everyone. I picked up a Hopsolator bottle in matte black for my dad for Father's Day, and he really loves it. He works outside on his truck a lot, so the Hopsolator bottle is perfect for him, since the Hopsolator keeps the beer cool and insulated and prevents condensation while also shielding your hands from the cold. Plus, it keeps the beer ice cold until the last drop, guaranteed. Brewmate also has something for the wine lover. I ordered myself a wine insulator and a pair of the uncorked wine glasses in the beautiful glitter aqua color. The wine insulator holds a full bottle of wine and comes with a silicone funnel for easy transferring. I took my wine insulator down to the beach last week and my wine stayed chilled and refreshing after six hours in the Florida sun. Don't settle for warm alcohol. Chill out with your favorite drinks all day long with Brewmate. Visit brewmate.com and add code MOMS to get 15% off your first order. That's 15% off your first order when you go to B-R-U-M-A-T-E dot com and add code MOMS. And now back to the episode. So Sheila's just found out from the hotel concierge that she's paying for two rooms and that Tommy is clearly there in the same hotel 
And that's got to be where Heather's been running off to. So Sheila becomes really hysterical when she realizes this, that she's stolen her credit card, booked this room, and she probably paid for Tommy's airfare to fly from Chicago to Bali. She calls Heather and demands that she comes down to the lobby. After a quick argument, Heather agrees to go back to the room that she shared with her mother, but she remained indignant and shrugged off Sheila's emotional protesting. Once they were back in the room, the tensions began to escalate even more. Heather refused to provide Sheila with an explanation or an apology, and instead she sat around texting Tommy for hours. As a parent, I don't know that anything would make me crazier than having a discussion. More enraged. Yeah. (laughs) No, that's tough. I mean, even now, you know, our kids are just really getting into technology a little bit more and, you know, talking to their friends and stuff. So the idea of your kid ignoring you while you're upset, yeah, I, you know, that was rough for me to hear. So at around 8.30 a.m., Tommy knocked on the door of Sheila and Heather's room. Once inside, a heated argument between the three began to ensue. Emotions were running high at this point, and Heather decided that this was a good time for her to drop a bombshell on her mom, and that bombshell was that she was pregnant with Tommy's baby. According to Heather, her mother snapped when she learned this news and began to threaten Heather with a knife, screaming at her that she was going to kill her. As the fight escalated, Heather alleges that she looked to Tommy to protect her from her mother, and that's when the situation really became unglued. Tommy pulled out the metal handle of a fruit bowl that he had apparently brought with him from his room and viciously beat Sheila in the face until she was dead. After the murder, Tommy and Heather had to figure out what to do next. They considered several options for what they could do with the body, including telling the hotel staff that there was a terrible accident, but they decided to go with something that wouldn't immediately raise alarm and alert police. They needed a plan that would give them enough time to flee from Bali before the body was even discovered. After mulling over a few ideas, Tommy returned to his room to get a large suitcase, which they had planned to put Sheila's body inside. By the time the two had gotten the body in the suitcase, it was noon. They came up with a plan to take the suitcase down to the lobby and put it in the trunk of a taxi, but of course, this is a super heavy suitcase and a hundred something plus pounds, and they have to make up excuses to explain the weight to the bellboy. So Heather and Tommy had the suitcase hoisted into the trunk of a cab, and then they asked the driver to wait while they checked out of the hotel. So they went back inside. But when they got inside and they got to the front desk, they ran into a problem. Heather was told that only the cardholder who was paying for the room would be able to check out of the hotel, which meant that Heather's passport and everything else that was in this lockbox in the hotel was secure and she couldn't get access to it unless her mom was there to check out. So Heather has no ID now. She can't get her passport. She can't get any money. And they really have no plan B at this point. Heather and Tommy make a decision to make a break for it. They know that Heather doesn't have a passport. She doesn't have any money. They have this huge, huge problem on their hands, which is the fact that they have just murdered Heather's mom and they have now, they have her body in a, in a suitcase and it's in the trunk of a cab that's outside. So they don't really have a lot of options. So there's not very many ways out of this hotel. There was only about three exits. I think I read in one report, one was out the front door, which is where the taxi cab was. And then they also had back, you know, exits. And then there was an option to You could jump over a wall that was in the pool area and that would take you out to a highway and then you could go do whatever. So they decided, and this was actually seen on surveillance at a later time, they decided to jump the fence that was surrounding the hotel property. So from there, they hailed another cab, which they had take them immediately to the airport. So these kids thought that they would be able to talk their way through immigration and customs at the airport even though they didn't have passports. And when that plan failed, because of course it would, um, <laughs> they they got another cab and they had that taxi driver take them to a different hotel, a much cheaper hotel, not $2,000 a night. It was more like a motel. So meanwhile, back at the resort, the taxi driver that now had Sheila's body in his trunk had waited for two hours before he gave up on waiting for the kids to come back. And he finally opened up his trunk and saw that the suitcase, which was partially open, was leaking blood. Mm. 
So he panicked and he actually went inside the hotel to kind of ask like, hey, did you guys see these two people that came and put, you know, their, their luggage in my car and I, did they check out? Like, what's the deal with them? I'm really suspicious. There's something wrong, you know, with this luggage that I have in my vehicle. These people haven't come back for two hours. So the hotel concierge told him to take the suitcase to the police station. And that's exactly what he did. He got in his taxi and he drove to the police station and told them, hey, there's a suspicious piece of luggage in the trunk of my car. So when the police opened it up, they discovered Sheila's body in this suitcase. So an immediate search was started for Heather and Tommy. It didn't take the police very long to figure out that the two of them had already tried to flee the country, but that they were stopped at the airport. So they knew that these two were still in Bali and it wouldn't be too long before they figured out what hotel they were staying in. As we said before, they're very young. Heather is 18. Tommy is 21. Neither one of them has, pa- you know, legitimate passports on them. They don't have any money. There's not really much they can do. So the following day, police located the two of them at another hotel, which they had booked in their own names. They didn't even try to oh my gosh. use fake names or anything. They actually used their own names. And they storm this hotel room. So when they get in there, Heather and Tommy are still actually in bed. And they didn't really seem to care too much that the police were there. They were very stoic as they were both placed under arrest. Apparently, these two had concocted a story that they believed would convince police that they were also victims. They also tried to get on a plane without a passport internationally. So they've got ideas. They're just not great. Their official story was that a gang had attacked them all and actually murdered Sheila, but that they had managed to escape. Unfortunately for Heather and Tommy, there were witnesses and security footage showing that they had been the ones to take the suitcase down to the taxi. Indonesian police held the couple for 48 hours before formally designating them prisoners. Heather was given an ultrasound and a urine test to confirm her allegation that she was pregnant which the police really thought that could have been a lie just to manipulate them. The test showed that she was, in fact, pregnant. Pretty early on in the investigation, the police started getting tips and reports about the volatile relationship between Sheila and Heather. As they interviewed more witnesses, they learned that staff members had seen Sheila and Tommy arguing in the lobby the night before she was killed. But the most incriminating evidence against Tommy and Heather was the numerous messages they sent each other in the hours and days leading up to the murder. Investigators found text messages and Facebook messages that proved that the couple had planned the murder and openly talked about it in live time as they were about to carry out the killing. They also discussed money, which they had incorrectly assumed could be as much as $11 million. Their code word for murder was saying hi. And on the day of the murder, Heather sent a text to Tommy that said, there is no better time to say hi, is there? Indicating that she was ready to kill her mother right that moment. How many times do people say hi that this is not going to like be a big flag if you see it over and yeah. over again in messages? Well, it's I guess that's that's their whole point when they have a code word is they're thinking, you know, this is not suspicious. But obviously, when you kill someone and your whole entire text message, you know, your whole text thread and conversations are read, the police are going to figure out you had a code word if you discussed it in text. Like, duh, obviously, they're going to know that that was your code word. You know, that's why I always get confused about code words. Because I'm like, if you actually discuss what the code is in the text messages, yeah. then it's not really going to be a secret. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, from here on out, instead of murder, we're going to say hi, okay? Do we both have that? Right. Great. <laughs> now it just makes it complicated. So for the next several minutes, the couple sent texts back and forth, encouraging each other to go through with it and discussing what to use as a weapon. What is the weapon called? Hello? I don't really understand. That's another <laughs> dumb idea. So the best they could come up with was a heavy metal handle from a fruit bowl that was in Tommy's room, which he hid under his shirt and took with him whenever he went into Sheila's room. During the text exchange, the couple referred to themselves and each other as Bonnie and Clyde. Why does everyone do this? I just, okay, I love young people and I love (laughs) 20-year-olds, but I just feel like this is a very 18 and 21-year-old thing to do. I know. I mean, I think they're just referring to Jay-Z and Beyonce at this point. I don't think they know anything about actual Bonnie and Clyde. (laughs) So Heather sent instructions on how Tommy should enter the room and even mentioned that her mom was awake and pondered the idea of suffocating her. In the final messages before the attack, the couple decided on, quote unquote, knocking her out. Heather's last message read, 
okay, just knock her out. It'll be so much easier. Again, why are we using hi if we're literally saying everything else? It makes no sense. Minutes later, Sheila was beaten to death. But investigators also found messages between Tommy and his cousin named Robert Bibbs about the murder and potentially about these this millions of dollars in inheritance that Tommy and Heather thought that Heather was going to be inheriting. The cousins discussed ways to pull off the murder and get away with it so that Heather could inherit the money. An autopsy was performed on Sheila, and it was determined that she had died of asphyxiation after suffocating on her own blood. She had a broken neck and several defensive wounds. After a four-month investigation, the police transferred Tommy and Heather to the custody of prosecutors, and a few weeks later, they were charged with premeditated murder, which carries a possible penalty of death. At this point, Heather needed money. Just a few months before the murder, Sheila had put her $1.56 million estate in a trust to be used for the health, support, education, and maintenance of her only child. Sheila had put her brother William down as a trustee, and he had control of the money until Heather was 30 years old. So, Heather sues her uncle for access to the money so she could pay for her defense. And she actually wins the right to access this fund. So, I kill you, and I'm also going to use your money to help get me off for killing you. And it's so crazy because you – there's a lot of stories that are like this where money is involved and where the victim of the story has a lot of money to lose and the person who kills them has a lot to gain. So, that's – pretty much what happened here. And there's usually laws against this kind of thing. But in this case, I guess, I don't know, she found some kind of a loophole. So yeah, she was able to get access to her mom's money, even though she was on trial, you know, she was suspected of killing her. That whole thing just blows my mind that that a judge actually granted her access to that money. But would that be different? Because it wasn't like a life insurance policy. It was a trust fund that she was entitled to. Does that make sense? I mean, you know. I mean, maybe that is why. I don't. You, I'm asking you a lot of know. questions to be a lead on a We're not professionals. <laughs> we don't know how anything works. I don't know how trusts work. I don't know how inheritance works. <laughs> I've never been gifted either of those. So, yeah, I have no idea. That's what I. That's the only thing I could think. Like, well, maybe it's different because it's a trust. Or maybe it's different because it was in Bali and it wasn't in the U.S. Not sure. But this was actually a Chicago judge that awarded her really? the money. Oh, that makes yeah, sense because so, that's where the money was. Yeah. I just thought it was interesting because she was awarded the money and I would think in a situation like this where you're, you know, accused of murdering someone, I I just feel like it's a little odd to me that you would be able to get the money. Yeah, but she hadn't been convicted, so that's maybe true. innocent until proven guilty. We are really <laughs> just in it to win it here tonight. So the judge ordered that her defense would be paid for from the trust that we as we've been mentioning, but he had strict instructions on who was allowed to represent Heather, and he actually ordered the civil lawyers to find more competent representation. This was also interesting to me, that the judge in Chicago who was, you know, overseeing this case, you know, of who's going to get this money or if Heather is even entitled to it, it was odd to me that he allowed her to have the money, But it was a little more even weird to me that he said, you know, yes, but the court is going to pay. They said, yes, you can have the money for your legal defense. The court is going to pay it directly for you out of this inheritance. But they also said, like, we're not going to leave you high and dry. They said you have to have actual legitimate representation, which apparently at this point Heather did not have. So that was kind of a whole thing they had to fight for, which I just thought was really interesting. I mean, I guess it makes sense. That the judge is saying, like, if if I'm going to give you this money, I want you to have, uh, you know, you have to use it for actual yeah. good. No, I, you know, a good attorney. Yeah. But a lot of things in this case really confuse me, though. And this was one of them that they said, you know, you have to find better attorneys. Yeah. And we have more to get into this story after one last break to hear a word from this week's sponsors. My favorite summer wardrobe consists of a light top, summery skirt, and the perfect pair of shoes. Here in Florida, for many people, their summer shoes are flip-flops, but mine are my favorite all-season shoes, my Rothy's. Mandy and I both got a pair of Rothy's, and I picked out the steel gray tennis shoe, which pairs perfectly with my summer wardrobe, or really any wardrobe. From yoga pants to dresses, it works with everything. They're super cute and, best of all, comfortable from the moment I put them on. Rothy's aren't just comfortable, they're also adorable. 
Rothy's come in a wide range of colors and patterns, and they're available in four different silhouettes. Plus, they're constantly launching new styles, so you're guaranteed to find a pair or three that you love. They launch new colors and patterns every few weeks, and they sell out constantly. I have my eye on a pair of loafers now in Calypso. From the loafer to the sneaker, from the flat to the point, there is sure to be a pair of Rothy's for every woman or girl in your life. Check out all the amazing styles available right now at rothys.com slash moms. Go to rothys.com, that's R-O-T-H-Y-S dot com slash moms to get your new favorite flats. Comfort, style, and sustainability. These are the shoes you've been waiting for. Head to rothys.com slash moms. This summer, give yourself support with a boost. Whether you're looking for energy, better sleep to maintain stress, or something else to help you feel your healthiest, Care Of has you covered. Care of is a subscription service that delivers vitamins and supplements to you, customized for your specific health needs. Care of starts with a fun online quiz. I took it and it's really easy and fun and ask questions about your diet, your health goals, and your lifestyle choices. It only takes five minutes to find out your personal, scientifically backed vitamins and supplement recommendations. It's so quick and easy to take, which means you could sneak away and take the quiz like I did before the kids even notice you're gone. You answer questions in the quiz, like how much sleep you're getting or not getting, and if you're looking for more energy, if you need something to support weight management or healthy hair, skin, and nails. It gets really personalized for you and your life. Depending on your personalized care of plan, you'll get daily vitamin packs and or protein powder sent right to your door. It's so cute and customized. The packets even have your name on them. You can also modify your subscription at any time when your needs or preferences change. For 25% off your first care of order, go to takecareof.com and enter code MOMS. Again, for 25% off your first care of order, go to takecareof.com and enter code MOMS. And now back to the episode. So several months have passed with Heather and Tommy being behind bars and they're awaiting their trials. And in February of 2015, Heather spoke out to the media By this point, she was due to deliver her baby in just a couple of months, and she was really beginning to panic over this whole situation that she had going on. She did a series of interviews for the Chicago Tribune, and she really asserted her innocence, and she insisted that she had no motive to kill her mom, who she claimed she, quote, loved with all her heart and missed every day. The interviews were really a plea for help. Heather alleged that her defense team had not been getting paid from her trust as the judge had ordered, and she blamed all of this on her civil attorneys and claimed that they had denied her a fair chance at defending herself by obstructing the release of these funds. A couple of weeks later, the trials began, and these are trials that would actually end up going on for months. On March 17th, 2015, during Heather's trial, she gave birth to a baby girl named Stella. Indonesian law allows incarcerated mothers to keep their babies with them in prison until they are two years of age, which is what Heather had hoped to do. Shortly after the baby's birth, prosecutors recommended a 15-year sentence for Heather and an 18-year sentence for Tommy, but the trial continued for another month before coming to a conclusion on April 21st, 2015. A three-judge panel unanimously ruled that Heather and Tommy were guilty of premeditating the fatal beating of Sheila Von Wiesmack, and Heather was sentenced to 10 years in prison, while Tommy, who was the main aggressor in the attack, was given 18 years. Sheila's family was really devastated over what they considered to be light sentences on these two, but a judge stated that several factors were weighed in their decision, including the fact that Heather had just given birth to a baby and that she was also polite and respectful throughout the trial. What on earth? Yeah. Locked Up Abroad told me none of this would ever happen and that you just go to prison in another country and it's no one says you're polite and respectful and gives you less time. I've been lied to. Okay. Well, here's the thing. I've always heard horror stories about like, If you think prison in the U.S. is bad, like you don't want to go to prison in another country. I've heard this. This is the thing I've heard. It's a stereotype that you've heard. Locked Up Abroad tells you this. Yeah, everybody has heard this. Like, you know, you don't want to be stuck in a foreign prison. But I saw footage of Heather in this Indonesian prison. And I have to tell you, it kind of looks like a vacation. Wow. I mean, I don't mean that lightly, and I don't mean, like, co- commit a crime in Indonesia. I just mean this prison that she was in, okay, compared to, like, eat, like you know, you watch 60 Days In. You watch Love After Lockup. You know what prison looks like. 
this prison that prison she was Mike. in did not look anything like that. She was in regular plain clothes, like she's raising a baby. The other inmates are able, like they made, it's just crazy. They have like regular stuff. It doesn't seem like prison. It's not like, it's not like it is here in the U.S. The prison that she is in, in Bali is nothing like what you think of when you think of prison. At least this specific prison in Bali, this is kind of how it goes. Yeah, I, yeah, it's kind of crazy. So when baby Stella was around three months old, Heather began to consider her options. And she had really vowed to keep this child with her for as long as she possibly could, which under Indonesian law is two years. But she knew that she would have to choose someone to care for her daughter after she turned two. She eventually decided that an Australian family who had been helping her financially with different things for Stella would foster her until Heather was released from prison. So this family that she actually ended up deciding was going to raise her daughter, this was somebody who met her before she was actually incarcerated. She was in the process of being convicted or being charged with murder. And this family saw her and knew that she was pregnant. And they said, you know, we really want to help this young woman and her new baby that she's going to have. They really just took her in without judgment. And she had a relationship with them since before the baby was even That's born. Incredible. So it really is incredible. And so, and, and I really just, I, my heart goes out to that family that kind of, put themselves out there like that and, you know, put themselves in a position to care for for Heather and for this baby. Since being behind bars, Tommy Schaefer is now a born-again Christian who has assisted in baptizing dozens of other inmates. And he says that his life was going really well until his girlfriend died in 2014, which we talked about a little earlier. And he says that that triggered a downward spiral for him. And he claims that he was very easily manipulated by Heather in his emotional state, but that he is not a murderer at his core. In one interview, he referred to Heather as a black hole and claims to have had firsthand experience with the violent relationship between she and her mother. He said that in the heat of the moment, he thought killing Sheila would help Heather and help the entire situation. Heather spent the first two years of her sentence raising her daughter in the prison, which she said had been a wonderful experience and she was so thankful that she was able to do that. On Stella's second birthday, the inmates at the jail threw a little birthday party before Heather was forced to hand the child over to the family that would raise her until Heather's release. Tommy's mom actually put up a fight and attempted to sue for custody of the little girl, but a judge denied the request. In an article that was dated June 18th, 2019, so that was just last month, I read that Heather could actually be released from prison less than two years from now due to good behavior. Wow. She says that she has no desire to return to Chicago or the U.S. ever again, and that even if she gets deported when she's released, she and Stella will return to Bali, where she says it is safer for them. So that is a very, very crazy story. One final note that there was one little loose end that I don't think I tied up there in the story. Tommy's cousin that was allegedly conspiring with him and Heather to commit this murder. He was eventually sentenced to nine years for his part in the crime. They had like a lot of evidence against him. They had like Facebook messages and stuff of them talking about how to do this murder. And he was supposed to be handsomely rewarded with what they thought was going to be multi-million dollars, but didn't turn out that way. So he ended up getting nine years for his part, which surprised me. Yeah. I think it just surprises me because Heather was only given 10 mm -hmm. years in Bali. And then this guy was given nine years just for not just, but for texting about it, you know, yeah, he wasn't even um, there. Right. And so, I mean, that's conspiracy of course, but it does seem crazy in comparison to the other, the other sentences, even Tommy's who's only 18 and his yeah. cousin gets nine and Heather only gets 10. That's, that's pretty crazy. Yeah. So that was our episode for this week. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Melissa, I think we have to give a few more details about the stuff we said in the beginning about the live show and other things that we talked about. Great. <laughs> 
That was a wonderful setup for me. Okay, so yes, as Mandy said in the beginning of the show, the thing we swore we would never do, but we are now doing because we were invited to do it, and so there's a lot less pressure on us. With Corpus Delicti, our friends Lindsay and Jen, we are going to do a live show with them, and that is going to be on Sunday, September 22nd at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time at the Wild Rose Cafe in Hoover, Alabama, so it's near Birmingham. I don't know this. I've just been told this. We will have ticket information in the show notes. We're really excited. Tickets are already being sold and people seem to be buying them. So I don't know what's happening there or who's hacked into their system, but it seems to be going pretty well. And we hope you guys will come to that. That will be really, really fun. And I don't know what we're doing here. We have no idea what we're doing. We're going to do our best. It's going to be like this, but not edited. So good luck. Yeah. (laughs) And like Mandy said, we are going to be working on a Southern True Crime podcast meetup and just stay tuned for more information on that. We will have that pretty soon for you guys. Last thing, we were going to do a different last thing before we go this week, but we had to kind of change it around. And one thing we wanted to talk to you guys about, one thing we were wanting to do at the last thing before we go, we wanted to kind of mix it up. We had the idea of doing like a hero segment. Again, haven't come up with a good name for it, but where you can nominate someone in your life who has who makes a difference in other people's lives. They volunteer, they help do whatever, they're, I don't know, what do nice people do? It's like Oprah, but like in the regular world is what we're looking for. So right. our idea was, you know, send us these heroes in your life and the email address will be in the show notes, but last thing before we go at gmail.com, hero in the subject line and just tell us who in your life deserves to be recognized. And we're looking at doing like a gift card every month and we're going to use any money we make from our merch sales and we're going to use our portion of it and we will send them a gift card. So that'll change month to month how much it is, but that's what we want to do. So last week in our Facebook group, Stacy, this is like three times we've mentioned her in a row and I'm over <laughs> it. I'm over people talking about how great she is now. Oh my gosh. She's getting a really big head and so is everyone who knows her. I see people tagging her now or writing on her Facebook wall and they're like, oh my gosh, are you the Stacy <laughs> that moms and murder are talking about? Yes, that's the Stacy. You guys are friend friends with the, Stacey, the third mom. Yeah. You guys are friends of the third mom. And I even saw Stacy's mom comment <laughs> at, on something. So yeah, it's getting ridiculous. We love you, Stacy. <laughs> I love it though. She's so great. And she's been around since the beginning. So if anyone's going to be the third mom, I'm glad, glad it's Stacy. So she had posted something in our Facebook group, basically what's what nice things, selfless Sunday, what nice things have you done for other people? And so I was kind of scanning that list and there was somebody The rest of our hero people will come from people you guys nominate, but we kind of came across this one and thought it was pretty good. And this is Becky H. in our Facebook group. And she just mentioned that she volunteers for hospice and currently visits two wonderful ladies a few times a month. And I guess I believe her mom had went through hospice and had a really positive experience with the hospice volunteers that came into their home. And so I think it's a really, it's just an incredible thing to do to be with somebody in those last moments with hospice. So we are going to, I'll message you, Becky, or if you hear this, we'll know if you're a listener, if you write us, how about that? No, (laughs) we'll we'll write you and we're going to send you a gift card and that's how we'll kick this whole thing off. And we'll do this once a month. Yeah. First Tuesday. Definitely. I know. And thank you so much, Becky, for doing that. That is such an important thing to do. I don't talk about, we we don't really talk about like our super personal lives too much on the show, but my brother-in-law had cancer and he passed away a couple of years ago, but the hospice people that he had with him in the his final days, they were so great and so amazing. And they are still friends of the family yeah. now. My sister-in-law sold the house that they lived in at the time. And one of the hospice workers that was working that helped take care of my brother-in-law actually bought the house. Oh, that's incredible. And it's just a really sweet story. So I have such a soft spot for hospice workers and people who do that kind of work. And I just love it so much. So thank you so much, Becky. And I just love that you do that. It's incredible. Yeah. It's a, it takes a special person to do that for sure. Okay. We don't really have any more last thing before we go. Like I said, our thing kind of fell apart this week. So yeah, we will though next week. We we will have it together next week. I promise. But in the words of Mariah Carey, this, well, no, I don't have a hole in the words of Mariah Carey. She has a song about heroes. So that's what, what this is. And just imagine us yeah. playing that song because there's no way we can afford to play it. So just play it to yourself. No, we sure can't. Gosh, I totally wish we could afford to outro to Mariah Carey's songs, but we're not quite there there yet, yet. guys. Mm -hmm, (laughs) Just pretend. There you go. 
So we will be back next week. Same time, same place, same whatever this is. Last thing before we go, we're going to play the promo for our friend Shannon. She hosts the show Lessons from Lifetime. So make sure you check that out. Definitely. Have a great week. All right, guys. Bye. Do you love a good Lifetime movie as much as I do? Do you find yourself screaming at the television for the heroine to do or not to do something you know she should or shouldn't be doing? This is Shannon from Shannon and Everybody's Business Podcast. Coming at you with something new. Lessons from Lifetime, a podcast where I dig out the lessons from Lifetime movies and bring them here just for you. There are so many lessons that can be learned, ladies. I'm not kidding. If the bad guy looks dead, let's double and triple check before we turn and walk away. How about we just stop meeting people online altogether? Let's not introduce ourselves to the new neighbors down the street. And definitely, definitely not help that good looking guy out on the side of the road. He will stalk and or murder you. So join me each week. I'll be covering the classics like Death of a Cheerleader and Every Woman's Dream to the newer ones like Jody Arias, Dirty Little Secret, and my new favorite, Love You to Death, the story of the Munchausen mom. You can find Lessons from Lifetime on all your favorite podcast platforms. Can't wait to see you there. Thanks so much for listening to the Moms of Murder podcast. Make sure to check back with us next week for a new episode. You can also find us at momsandmurder.com where you can connect with us via social media. Please make sure you subscribe and give us five stars because giving us four stars would be a crime. Thanks so much.